Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum fires away. Pumps it in. 3 NBA podcast is powered by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Big 3 NBA podcast. As always, Ashraf Blakely, Gary Washburn, myself, Kwani Lunas. Thanks for tuning back in with us. Gary, Sharad, how are you two doing? I'm good. I'm real good. Cute earrings, Kwani. I like those. I like those. Thank you. Thank you. Little blingy bling. Fantastic. <laughs> Can't even, that's why I don't give compliments because folks act like they don't know how to take them. And the, we don't know when to take you seriously. I'm always serious. Oh. I don't joke. I don't know about that. I'm serious Gary, about that. Right, G? Uh, I'm good, Kwani. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. But are you good, good? He's I'm good, trying good. to follow Sherrod 2024. And be better. Oh, <laughs> I forgot about that actually. And I must say, you are How's failing miserably, but that's all right. Really, you're failing miserably? No, he is. I'm failing oh, miserably. Good. All We're good. All doing better week by week, day by day, hour by hour. The Celtics also doing better. Well, generally speaking, they were already doing okay, but they took <laughs> they went to Toronto, beat the Raptors. Sherrod, we last spoke right before they took on their former head coach, Emi Odoka and his Rockets. They won that game as well. But actually, let's just backtrack. Let's just recap that Rockets game first. What were your biggest takeaways from that win? The Rockets, you know, they, they're, they're a feisty team like their head coach, uh, but the Celtics were just too talented, too motivated, too much Tatum. I mean, you, they, they were just a better team and they played like the better team. They didn't, they, the game was relatively close early on, but the Celtics, you know, they just shifted into a different gear and, and showcase why they have the best record in the NBA and they're the best team in the NBA. Yeah, I thought the Celtics, um, you know, took the Rockets' blows. I mean, it was a pretty competitive game, you know, when the, midway through the second quarter, then they pulled away late in the first half, and then the third quarter turned into a pickup game, and they just, you know, Houston had nothing left coming off a of back-to-back. You know, Fred Van Vliet, five points. I just thought he was awful uh, in that game. Dylan Brooks come back from an injury. But then in 59 points combined, 50, 14 rebounds from Jason and Jalen. You know, they showed their best. Uh, they were hitting threes. The Celtics played a, a quality ball game and, and kind of a trap game, a, a game that could have been, you know, tougher. Houston has got some athletes, but they – uh, they punched him out in the second half, so I was impressed with the way they approached that game with all seriousness. Collected a win they should have coming off that Milwaukee game and uh, move forward. So, yeah, you know, because I said Houston can be with Jabari Smith, with Jalen Green, with Brooks, with Van Vliet, with uh, Alfred and Sengun, uh, a very quality young team, a rising team. So that could have been more difficult than it was. But so I was impressed that the Celtics put them away and, and turned the fourth quarter into garbage time. And that being said, Joe Mazzula, I'm going to quickly kind of switch up our rundown a little bit and do a quick game of pick and roll. So post the win against Houston, Joe Mazzula made a, a point to mention that a lot of teams don't look at Sam Hauser and don't think he can defend because don't think they need to defend him because he's a white shooter. What did you two make of those comments? Well, they don't but think he can defend because they don't think he can white. defend. Sorry, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. yeah you were right first time, Kwani. Yeah, my bad. But pick and roll, do you think this is fact or fiction and why or why not? You got it, Gary. Uh, fact, I think Sam Howes is white. See, he's going to be that guy, Kwani. He's not being better. Kwani, I'll, I'll, I'll get it started since he's going he gonna to be that dude. I'm in, just in saying, you know what you yeah. asked me? The, the question that she asked you was, do Is he white? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just saying, you no. Know, um, I do think people might underestimate him because he is white in terms of the ability to defend. Um, obviously, there's stereotypes in professional sports. Um, if there's a white running back like a Christian McCaffrey who's one of the best in the league, people will uh, take a second look. Or, or if you're a white cornerback, and so uh, you know, are, are are there defenders who are premium defenders who are white or good defenders? 
Uh, people probably don't estimate that that's going to happen very often. So, yeah, I think people do underestimate uh, Howell's defense because he's white, because he's lanky, because he doesn't look like, you know, he, he gets in and digs in defensively um, because it's stereotype, unfortunately. So, yes, I do think Stan Howard is white. And, yes, I do think that there is a um, stereotype against him because he's a white uh, player that he is not a good defender. And I think Missoula said that several times this year and probably gets tired of getting asked about Hauser's defense. And every time you ask him, as we all know, Joe's going to say the same thing. And he's going to keep saying, quit asking me about Hauser's defense only because you think he can't play defense because he's white. He can play defense. So let's get that registered in our psyche that Hauser can play defense. I think we already have registered that he's white. White man can defend. New movie coming. I in. knew that was coming. Listen, it, it, that's what you get, Gary. That's what you get. Thank you, Kwani. Thank you for that. That's what you get. Here's the thing about Sam Hauser, though, uh, and the whole defense narrative thing. Just like guys work at becoming better shooters, they also have to work at becoming better defenders. And Sam puts a ton of time into that side of the ball. The guy that he works with with the Celtics assistant coach is Tony Dobbins. And for those who are not familiar, Tony Dobbins was an, an elite defender in college. And when he played overseas in France, he was three-time defensive player of the year in the top division in France. So this is a guy that he worked with on a day-in, day-out basis who's similar size, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, so as a slim build, just like Sam. And so when he's working with Sam, he's literally working with a guy who, from a physical standpoint, very similar to himself. And the one thing Sam does, and it's the most basic fundamental thing to being a defender at any level, and Sam does it consistently, keep your ass between the, the person who has the ball and the rim. When you do that defensively, you have a chance to be successful no matter what that shooter does because shot takers don't like when you're in front of them. They don't like a hand in their face. They don't like a body between them and the rim. And Sam has been consistently doing that. And that's why, to me, he's such an underrated and underappreciated defender because he doesn't go for stales. He's not trying to pin your stuff on a glass, even though he's caught a few bodies that way this year. Uh, he doesn't do the things that we typically associate with being a very good defender or even an average defender. What he does is make sure that he's solid at that end of the floor so that at the other end, he can do what he's paid to do, which is knock down shots. Uh, they're not looking for Sam to be Marcus Smart or Dylan Brooks or any all NBA defender. They just need him to be solid. And that's why he's able to stay on the floor because he has not allowed himself to be a defensive liability. Uh, and, and again, whether you think he's a good defender or not, that point is, is very clear. And they've been very consistent with this. As long as he's giving them solid effort and solid production at that end of the floor, Sam Hauser is going to stay in the rotation. The NFL season is wrapping up, but there is still time to get on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a five dollar bet that's 150 bucks in bonus bets win or lose the app is so easy to use and there are so many different ways to bet like live same game parlays find bets in the new explore tab pick a parlay in the parlay hub the best way to find popular parlays and more so visit fanduel.com boston and make your first bet a layup fanduel official partner of the nfl All right, moving along to the next game after, obviously, Houston. The Raptors, which we started off talking about, they put the Raptors away. No Jalen Brown in that game. Derek White and Drew Holiday, each with 22. Tatum with 19 points, 14 rebounds, six assists. But what were your overall takeaways from the Celtics beating this still rebuilding Raptors team? They handled the business. They, they, they did exactly what you should do against a team like that. Don't give them any hope. Uh, don't give them any, uh, you know, confidence that they can hang with you. And, and the Celtics, they were, they, even though the game was relatively close for a lot of stretches, you never felt as though the game was not the Celtics to win. They, it felt as though their control of the game was never an issue. Uh, and that's what you want to do against a team like that. Because in their building, and, and Gary knows this as, as well as I do, Toronto can get really rowdy. Uh, and loud and, and very 
difficult if that if the fans are engaged and the Celtics never gave their fans a, a legitimate reason to get overly excited about the game they made some runs but you never felt as though the Celtics were just letting this game get away from them I know it's quality one especially without Jason sorry Jalen um yeah I mean Toronto was the first time them facing Toronto with Quigley and Barrett so kind of a new look Toronto Raptors team or a team in Toronto that had won a couple of quality games um you know, still a very talented club. If you look at uh, Quigley and Barrett, obviously, and Scotty Barnes, who really wasn't himself. I, he was I, trash. Yeah, I don't game. know what was going on with Scotty Barnes. He was good when the team was back in Boston. Hit, hit like five, six threes. Um, I don't know what was going on with Scotty Barnes, but he was not himself in that game. And Siakam had flashes or whatever. Siakam kind of wasn't there either. And that's the problem when you face a team – with a bunch of guys who might be traded or with Siakam and, and, and there's like, well, what they're going to do, like, what are they going to do? Are they going to be, be sellers? And, and Toronto's in that play in kind of competition, but they're not really that you're just going to get inconsistent performances. So I think the Celtics, you know, they took control of the game and then they kind of lost it with Barrett was, who was very good. I thought uh, kind of led that charge and quickly. And then, you know, I think it was a seven-point lead for the Raptors, and then the Celtics chipped away. Jason Tatum took over. Then, a, the, then they outscored him, I think, a twenty-to-four run, and then kind of led from from there on in a couple of late runs that they had to stave off. And then Derek White hit that corner three, which was big, right in front of the Raptors bench. So, this is, you know, you're not going to always win by hundred points. You know, you're not going to always blow them out. They covered the spread for you betters out there. Um, they took care of business. They did what they're supposed to do. They held Toronto under 100 points, and they got the hell out of there. And that's what you want to do. Win the games that you're supposed to win. They don't always have to be fancy. Try to get that, you know, keep on that number one seed. We're one game now between, you know, the, the San Antonio game on Wednesday is game 41. So we are halfway in the season. So that's what you're supposed to be doing if I'm the Celtics. I think it's a quality win. And they've had a lot of impressive win this year. But that was a game that they could have let slip away. They might have lost last year, in my opinion, when Toronto goes up and it makes that run, third quarter run. I think they they out. I think they went on an eighteen to three run or something like that, or or, or sixteen to three to begin the third quarter. And you're like, man, you know, here come the Celtics third quarter issues again. But they bounce back. They were able to to retake the lead and then take control. Jason Tatum, I thought, was good, aggressive. Derek White was really aggressive. Um, Porzingis, Al Horver hit a key three. So playing together and, and you don't, they don't use injuries in, as an excuse. Okay, Jalen, take the night off. We got it. We got this. Okay, Jason, take the night off. We got this. Remember their last two wins over the Raptors. One was out Jalen. The other one was out Jason. Yeah. So uh, I was impressed with the way they took on uh, a quality opponent. I think still with quality players, and just took care of business on the road and got the hit home. You know, it's one of those games that could have been a very easy trap game. Uh, they didn't look at it that way. And now uh, they got a couple of home games before they go back on the road. You know what, Gary, before we move on, I, I wanted to get your, your take on uh, Chris Stas Porzingis. We all we talk a lot about what he does in terms of scoring the ball and all that. But, yo. He's kind of nice defensively. Like I was, I was just like we were talking about. We were talking about uh, Scotty, and we we're talking about Pascal, and they were one for eight combined when Chris Stapps was on them. Uh, wh- what have you seen about him defensively? Because I just remember when he was in New York, New York, he was a turnstile. Everyone yeah. was looking at him like, "Where Chris Stapps at? Look at their fingers. Look at their chops to go at him." And now. He's motivated. He's actually he's actually balling at that side of the court. I mean, what what is the difference you've seen in him? I just see a guy who's trying. I think a, a guy who's in a system um, that is <laughs> accentuates his, his strengths. Mm. A guy who knows he's playing on a championship caliber team, so he brings it. A guy who has matured from his New York days, where the Knicks went and said, "Okay, you are a franchise guy, Chris Stapps. You know, go out, go out there and be, go out there and be Dirk." go out there and lead us to championships. And he wasn't ready. And now he's matured. Now he's not the first option. He's the third or fourth option. If you include Derek white, and I think Derek white's the third option on this team. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he, he, he's playing with a little bit less pressure, a, a more defined role. And then he's got the freedom. You want to take those threes, Chris Stapps, 
I'm not crazy about all the threes he takes sometimes, you know, but he can hit, he can hit them, you know, he can defend the rim, rebound, you know, he's staying healthy, knock on wood with for Celtic fans. He's staying relatively healthy. There's no issues there. He's been, you know, he's played in back to backs. He's done well. You know, he, he's held up physically halfway through the season. So I think it's been a successful signing. Uh, sorry, acquisition. You know, we all feel bad for um, Marcus Smart not being able to be healthy most of this year and what's going on in Memphis, although they beat the Warriors last night uh, with, with their Memphis Hustle team. Um, the G League team. G.G. Jackson, baby. G.G. Jackson. I like that dude. Yeah, if that, you got you to gotta get a little bit of bass in his voice, though. When you talk to Shaq, yeah, you got to get a little bass in voice. That ain't a brother for you. G.G. Jackson. Um, so if you, you know, good for him. And, I, you know, he was all thrilled to talk to Shaq. That was that was great. To, so Maybe that's cool why his voice turned up like that. Cool parts of this game <laughs> is when these guys get a chance to talk, you know, meet and talk to their heroes. And that guy... That guy, I think, born in 04, so... He's the youngest player in the NBA. Yeah, Shaq to him is like... A, you Grandpa. Know, like yeah, a- it's like a meme. So, you know, it's like a, like a, like a you know what I'm saying? He's like, he's like Tupac and Biggie. When you, what do we call it when they, when they in concert now? The uh, hologram? Uh, yeah, they hol- <laughs> Shaq's a hologram. I, yeah, oh my goodness. Damn. You know, Shaq and Kobe, holograms of him, so... Wow. Uh, for him to talk to his hero, I think it was amazing. But I, but I just thought overall, going back to Celtics, quality win, and just an undercover quality win because that could have been a very tricky game, especially when they fell behind by seven points and it looked like okay, they let go of the rope here. But they said, okay, guys, relax, let's respond. And then the defense stepped up, played some zone, got Toronto. Toronto's not a good offensive, uh, sorry, not a good shooting team from the outside. You know, and they were able to, to to pull away. And I thought uh, one of their better wins in the, in the past few weeks. Let's get into guy number three that you just mentioned, Derek White. I mean, I think at this point he still has a pretty. It, it's a, obviously an interesting All Star campaign. We don't know if he's going to actually make it into the All Star game, but it's a good effort from the Celtics and their fans so far. But that being said, his shooting, obviously he's been contributing in various ways, but his shooting hasn't been as consistent in the last few games. Right now he's averaging 11.8 points per game, 3.2 rebounds, 3.6 assists while shooting 32% from the field. Do you think this is a slump or is there something to be concerned about overall from Derek or is it just the nature of the game? I think Derek needs to get to the all-star break and not have a game to play in. Just <laughs> shut it down for like a few days. Take a get nap. away from basketball. Because Derek, the, the thing that uh, I, I want him to be fresh as possible for this, this stretch run. Because to me, him and Porzingis are the wild card slash X factors in this team winning a championship. Uh, Derek White is the one guy that teams haven't really figured out how to adequately account for because you still have to account for Jalen. You still have to account for Tatum and Porzingis is a problem. Porzingis is a mismatch pretty much every time he steps on the floor. So Derek White is able to kind of roam freely for the most part. He, and now Drew Holiday is like Mr. Corner three ball. He's found that sweet spot where he can kill. He's absolutely murdering teams now. So now you just need all your pieces to be mentally and physically fresh as possible. Now I'm not worried about Tatum. Because Tatum has been through this rinse, recycle, repeat portion of the season enough to where he knows how to manage slash navigate himself so that down the stretch he he can be the best player he can be. Same thing with Jalen Brown. Porzingis, you know, again, he, he because everything is so much, as Gary pointed out before, everything is so much greater now for him. He's super excited. Derek is the one guy who... Has become such has become a bigger part of this team's success than I think he or the players or the manage or management thought, and because of that, you don't want to lose that momentum. And I think we're starting to see a little bit of that slip a little bit. I think he just looks like a guy that's mentally and physically worn down a little bit because uh, he's getting the same kind of shots that he's been knocking down most of the season. And watching him play. He looks a little bit slower uh, off the dribble, on the release. Just his timing seems to be a little bit off. And that, you know, just in my years of dealing with uh, being around NBA players, usually that's a sign of mental fatigue. Guys are just trying to fight through it, but they just can't be that player that they were when they were fresh. And that's why the All-Star break cannot get here soon enough for Derek White. 
Yeah. Um, I tend to think that um, he's just in a slump. Like I'm looking at his January numbers, as you mentioned, Kwani, um, 38% from the field, 11, 12 points a game, as opposed to 20 in December. Um, not getting to the free throw line much. 10 free throw attempts in eight games, um, as opposed to he had 43 attempts in 14 games in December. So his activity was higher in in, in December, and he was hitting those twos. His, his three-point percentage isn't bad, almost 40% from the three-point line in, in January. It's his two-pointers that have slipped. Uh, pretty pretty dramatically. So those floaters at the rim, he's just missing those. I think he's missed some bunnies. I know he's missed a couple of bunnies in that mm-hmm. Toronto game where he's right at the rim. But I just think it's a little bit of a slump for him. I mean, obviously he's a he's an Iron Man. He, he plays in almost every game. I think the only games he missed was the birth of his of his second child. So if I'm the, the Celtics, do you want to rest him or give him? Maybe you know it might be okay to give him a break here and there before the all-star break, like Sherrod said, maybe give him the all-star break off, but let's see what he does in the second half of the month. So he can maybe bounce back. Yeah, it's been a slow, but I, I, I was impressed with what he did against the, the Raptors. I thought he was, I thought he, he, I thought he took a lot of shots, but I also think he was able to bounce back some, you know, I'm looking, you know, not a great performance, seven for 18, but five for 11 from three. Um, in that Toronto in the Houston game, he was a plus twenty nine. So yeah, he's had some 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 slumps. I mean, four for sixteen in that Indiana game, three for eleven uh, against Minnesota. He's he's in a slump, <laughs> as, as you pointed out, Kwani. But I think he'll bounce back. Um, but I do think watching out for his endurance and fatigue, and maybe getting him a break. You know, he tweaked his ankle in that Toronto game. He came back. Might be okay to give him a break here and there. Whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like delivered right to your door. Each HelloFresh box is packed with farm fresh ingredients and everything arrives pre-portioned right to your doorstep for less hassle and less wasted food. Don't let recipe boredom strike because HelloFresh has more options than ever before. Dig into their biggest menu yet with over 45 dinner options to choose from weekly and even more market add-on items that suit any and every lifestyle. For me, I'm a big fan of the pork sausage rigatoni rosa and the Gouda burgers which take about 20 to 30 minutes to cook which is not a lot of time for a really, really good meal. And in order to get in on America's number one meal kit, go to hellofresh.com slash big three free and use the code big three free and that's b-i-g-t-h-r-e-e free for free breakfast for life one breakfast item per box while subscription is active that's free breakfast for life at hellofresh.com slash big three free with the code big three free and that's b-i-g-t-h-r-e-e free All right, let's move on. Coming up on this Celtics schedule, probably the most well-hyped game so far, this week at least, is the Wemby Mania that's going to be at the TD Garden on Wednesday. The number one over pick, overall pick, Victor, you know him. He will be playing his first game in Boston. So, of course, that means either Spurs fans or just NBA hype men. People will be all out for this game. And as you both know, this is probably the most hyped player since that we've seen at least since LeBron James. So how do you think, first of all, let's start with this. How do you guys think he's lived up to the hype so far as an NBA player? What do you think, Gary? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's special. I mean, he just got to get, hit the weight room, learn the game more, but he got no fear. That's the thing. He, right. he you know, and he's got these, you know, he's got the physical capabilities and he is got a lot of skills. We we've seen a, we've seen the skill set showing. So I mean, thirty four games, nineteen points, nineteen point six points and ten. He's averaging a double double, very very smooth double double. And and I'm looking at his minutes per game, twenty eight minutes, twenty nine. So he's not playing thirty five minutes a game. Now 
You know, 29% from three, that'll improve. He'll get better from the three-point line. But 80% from the line, 3.2 blocks a game, that leads the league. I mean, yeah, this dude is special. And, you know, unfortunately for now, he's on a really bad team. And, you know, I think the, the folks in San Antonio are like, listen, let's, you know, we're not going to have him out there killing himself against the Pistons or against, um, you know, the, the Hornets, you know, when, when we're preparing probably for another lottery pick. But let's make sure he gets enough time, 29 minutes a game, gets his 60, 65, maybe 70 games in, you know, um, and make sure physically he's okay. Then give him a nice NBA, another NBA summer. Um, because, you know, there's a lot to being Victor Wimbyama right now. You know, the all-star game is going to be the, it's going to be Wimby weekend, right? He's going to be in one of those skills challenges. He's going to be in the rookie game. He might be, you know, if he gets enough votes, he might be in the all-star game himself. So there's going to be a lot of Wimby in Indianapolis. And that's a lot for a 20 year old, 19 year old. That's a lot, right? Um, so I'm sure the Spurs were very careful with his timing, very careful with his availability and making sure he doesn't wear himself out. Then you get him to the summer. And remember, the summer's the Olympics. So he's only playing for Pitt Team France. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how that goes. So, but I'm completely impressed with what he's done. 19 and 10, you couldn't have asked for anything more than that on a team that, that's bad. Let's be honest. The Spurs are, to me, been one of the more disappointing teams because they have a lot of young talent. So it's not like they're playing a bunch of old men out there. They're just they're just not very good. And I don't know. If, I don't think there's any pressure on Popovich, but they got to take a step one of these days, right? And, and I think I thought it would be this year. Well, there's still time. And, and the way the West is this year, I mean, all you, I mean, at this point a good two, two and a half weeks of, of good basketball could very well be enough to get you in the conversation and potentially into that playing game. Because I think for them, that's the ceiling. I mean, to get to the playing game. And it's still something that's within the reach. But the thing that I, I think impresses me about him isn't so much the stats, but just the level of comfort that he has out there in the court. Um, he seems like a guy who knows he belongs, but isn't an arrogant a-hole about it. I mean, he's just, he's out there balling. I mean, he's not out there trying to put anybody on a poster. He's not out there hot dogging it and, and just making it about me, me, me. He's just out there balling. Uh, but when you're that tall and you got, and you're that close to the sky, you better believe folks are trying to put you on a poster. When I look at him, I think about like when Yao Ming first came to the NBA and everyone was trying to dunk on him. Uh, mm -hmm. I think about our good friend Taco, when every time he got his three minutes on the floor, somebody's trying to dunk on him. Uh, and let's be honest, if, if there's one player who you will put your money on who's going to try to dunk on him, it will be Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown might have more posters than any current NBA player. I mean, Jalen puts and, and he's got some top shelf victims. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you go, you start looking at the, all the guys in the all-star team. You start yeah. looking at all-star players in the East and West. The majority of them have been dunked on by Jalen. The bigs, not all, not the guards, but the bigs, the majority of the bigs at some point got boofed on by Jalen. Uh, and you better believe that Jalen has got a spot on the wall. <laughs> he's Wimby, I just got to get you. He's the Sharpie. Hey, Wimby, I got you. I got my Sharpie for you, Wimby. I can't. I need, I need you to sign this poster. Uh, but he's good, though, man. I mean, that's the thing. I, I, he, he's good, and he's comfortable in his own skin. He doesn't – there's there, the learning process, the growing pains that a lot of young players have, it seems like he's bypassed that. And he's – it's the only thing that he does that reminds me of LeBron James. Because LeBron was kind of like that when he first came to the NBA, where LeBron was really good, and you knew he was going to get better – but there are certain things that he did at an elite level that he didn't realize he was doing that showed a certain amount of growth and understanding and comfort with all these grown ass men that most guys your age don't have. I mean, Gary, to, to your point, when, when you were when I was watching the interview with with Gigi Jackson, uh, I mean, he was just like a little kid giggling. <laughs> I'm talking to Shaq. <laughs> and I'm thinking like that ain't women. Gerard, what? Don't, do, don't do that again. That he don't do that. That's what it, go don't back and go back and watch it. That, that. That's a great impersonation of how he was. Don't do that laugh again. Like the listeners, the viewers have had. A, we 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 get it. He was excited. Don't do that. <laughs> you know what? Don't do, don't do that again, please. 
<laughs> that whole be better in 2024, he missed that message. Right, right. Anyway, he's not being better than you. He still hate. He's just still hate. That's scary. Dark. We get it. The, the young man was excited to talk to Shaq. We don't need sound bottom, effects. The bottom line, he... <laughs> See, now I'm going to do it to torment him. Oh. The bottom line is Wimby is beyond his age in terms of ability and also maturity. Uh, and, and that's going to bode well for him going forward. He's going to be a great one. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. The only thing that could potentially limit him is health, which is, you know, the, that's the only issue for a lot of guys in the league. But he's he's a phenomenal talent. He's in a great situation because he's with an organization that knows how to deal with players like that. They've been down that road not once but twice uh, with David Robinson and Tim Duncan. So um, he's, he's, he's going to be a really good one. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see him up close and personal to see – you know, how, how good is he when you can see him literally in, in front of you? Right. Well, the Celtics continue their unbeaten streak at home. So that will be one game to gauge it. But the more interesting game will be Friday when the defending NBA champs are in town playing the Celtics as well. Do you think this game is a big deal, overhyped? Or is this something that we should be using to gauge what the end of the season will look like? It's a big deal because you're the Celtics – that's who you want to be. You don't want to play like Denver. You just want that hardware that they got. And there is, a, and I think most people agree, you may very well have to go through them to get it uh, because the, the West is wide open and Jokic is Jokic. He's still, when you look for, when you talk about all the different levels and levers that you have to pull to be a great player, he's, he's hitting them all. He can score, he can rebound, he can defend, he can pass, and he makes everyone around him better. Five tool talent, that's what he is. And if you're the Celtics, you, that's who you want to be. And you better believe they're going to be a little bit more amped for this game than most games. I would not be surprised if the Celtics blow them out. Because I think the Celtics are going to come into this game with a, a game seven mentality. That's how I think they're going to approach it. Uh, they want to send a message. They want Denver. They want the next time they see Denver, they want them to remember last time you was in Boston, what happened? You got that ass smacked. That's what they want. <laughs> oh man keep laughing Kwani <laughs> I think everything is hilarious um, yeah I think it's a big game in terms of a litmus test for both teams I mean Denver has kind of been up and down this year now they're they're on the on the way up um, but they want to test themselves against Boston on the road a uh, tough Eastern Conference opponent uh, we'll see more of what Denver has Tuesday night when they play the 76ers uh, but they get two days off, I believe, before they get to Boston. So they'll have some rest. The Celtics will be looking forward to that matchup, too. The Celtics got blown out last year at Denver. Um, so we'll see. I think that the, the Celtics play the, the Nuggets pretty well when they get to Boston. And they'll figure out the ways to defend uh, Jokic. And I think they, what they've done in the past is put a lot of pressure on Michael Porter Jr. Uh, to do a lot of scoring. So we'll see. I think it'll be kind of a, just a two teams filling each other out. Um you know, and, we, and our friend Reggie Jackson will be back for a BC standout. He's playing a, an increased role. With no Bruce Brown. Yeah. Uh, yeah no Bruce no Brown. I said he lost Bruce Chester Brown. He lost Jeff Green. So Christian Braun, Peyton Watson, those guys who were trying to fill those roles. Um, so I think it would be a very interesting game. And I said a good litmus test to see where both teams are at. And I think it's the biggest threat, obviously, to that 20, sorry, 19 game that is likely to be 20 after the San Antonio game, winning home winning streak to start the season. So the Celtics should be playing desperately in that game. Absolutely. And to your point, though, about Jokic, we've been tracking the MVP candidacy throughout the season. Obviously, it's still, we're like almost like halfway through the season at this point. But where do you think his candidacy stands in regards to Tatum? Jokic? He's ahead of him. He's ahead of him. That's Jokic close. is like top two, top three. Tatum, maybe fifth. Maybe. Maybe. Now, mm -hmm. now, there are, now, there are some folks, and I understand this, and, and I subscribe to this theory too. If you're the best player on the best team and you got best player type numbers, then, why yeah. aren't you the MVP? Uh, I think that's the argument that those who believe Tatum should be MVP are going to make. Mm -hmm. But uh, watching Jokic play uh, and seeing what that team's record is, that's a hard one to look past because they're top two, top three in the West. And without him, they might be sixth or seventh, maybe. Yeah. 
without Tatum, the Celtics are still probably top three in the East. They might be number one without him because that means more shots for Jalen and Drew Holiday would have a more active role. Porzingis would now all of a sudden be the solidified number three or four. Uh, so they, they'd still be a really good team. Uh, Denver, I think, would be an absolute dumpster fire without Jokic. Uh, I'm looking at the guys in that team, and there's no one that I'm feeling could step up and be that dude uh, for them if they didn't have Jokic. He's that talented, that impactful. Uh, and that's why, again, when they, when all the votes are tallied, he's going to be top three vote getter at the end of the day. Uh, whether he wins or not, that remains to be seen, but he will be no worse than three. Tatum should be in the top five with the best record, uh, best player on the best team. But I don't think this is a year where he's going to go any further than top five. Yeah, I do think um, Tatum is playing himself into the top five, but is with, 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 with what Abby Chen, our friend, called January Jason. Stop. Don't do that, Gary. He's bouncing back. What? Don't do that. That, that, that's my don't do that card. January Jason is bad. And I love Abby. You know, I love Abby. That's just bad. That was her. Like, I know. That's what I'm saying. He liked it. Then so. Don't bring it up. <laughs> don't do that. But Keep moving, Gary. As you were saying. With Adam, with, oh, sorry, with, um, with Jason, um, his ascension over the last couple of weeks, I think he's played himself back into the MVP discussion, maybe the top five, but I don't think he's near the top and I just think he's got to play a couple of more weeks months of just high level basketball and then Embiid has got to you know play enough games Jokic is going to always be there Ant-Man Anthony Edwards is going to be in that discussion our friend in Oklahoma City Shea Gillis is Alexander so there's a lot of competition for Jason I think it's a you know but I think it is kind of a, a showdown of top five players Who's and we didn't even talk about Giannis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I don't think, like, Jokic looks at it that way. Jokic looks at it in another game. Mm-hmm. But I do think both teams um, are looking at each other. Hey, this could be an NBA Finals preview. Um, the Nuggets have a lot of work to do in the West with Minnesota, with Oklahoma City. Maybe, And now the Clippers are kind of coming fast. Um, so it should be a, a very, very good matchup. And it's in. Let's see. I don't know their history of Jokic against Porzingis, but that should be an interesting matchup too. How they match up with each other. I'm sure they play against each other many times overseas and in Euro uh, play. So uh, I'm looking forward to that game. As are the two of us as well. So that's going to be a fun game as well. That's all I have for this week. Any final words from the two of you? I love how y'all just got Happy New Year. Like happy New Year. Not happy New Year. It is, not, it is past the June time. June 16th. Okay. I want Gary to be better. Anymore. My new resolution is Gary to be better. I don't care about anyone being, but just Gary be better. <laughs> your resolution for him to be better. Yeah, I got a very specific resolution. Since Gary wanted me to have a... Be better. Be specific, Shira. Be specific. I'm being specific now. You need to be better. Okay, I'll try. That's, I'll let that's you do quite it. the resolution. There you we'll go. see if you can accomplish that resolution for him. Working on it. <laughs> Working on it. Well, to our viewers and listeners, we want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Big Three NBA podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe. We write a review. If only if you're going to write a nice one. Because my mom always said, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. So and her mama was born on the same day as me, so we so she good people. Don't write a review if you don't feel like we were doing a good job. But at this point, since you're still listening, I like to imagine that you think we're doing a decent job. But all that being said, for <laughs> Sherrod Blakely and Gary Washburn, I'm Kwani Lunas. We appreciate you listening, and we'll be back next week. <laughs>